just try something. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's try it again now. We got the roar out. Okay. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And some of you need to tell your face that. Okay, let's smile. So I have a question for you this morning. Something I'd like for you to consider. How big is your God? Just, just think about it. There, we got it. The human mind is incapable of fully grasping the totality of God. Our finiteness limits what we can understand in regard to the infinite. Everything in this universe is, is finite. Only God is infinite. This is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, 12 through 13. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or who, with the breath of his hand, marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or who instructed him as a counselor? I dare say sometimes we attempt it. Sometimes we attempt to be a counselor to God. Well, God... Uh, this would be a better way. Would you consider this, God? The study of God should be an adventure for a lifetime. You see, the picture that we have of God in our hearts and minds establishes the way that we live. It really does. If we have a small view of God, that's going to be reflected in how we live. J.L. Packer in his book, Knowing God, an old, old book, says this. The ignorance of God, ignorance both of his ways and the practice of communion with him, lies at the root of most of the church's weakness. And so it isn't so. Absolutely, but it is. As we deal with that care for pastors, and that's the ministry that, that, that we lead. As we deal with care for pastors and deal with churches all across the nation, we're living in a time where a lot of churches and a lot of church members have a very small view of God. And it's reflected in how they view the church and how they view the leaders of the church. So to strengthen the church... Our view of God needs to, needs to be continually expanding and growing. So, the question to consider, how big is your God? And in order for us to kind of put that into context, we're going to look at the life and times of a man that you are very, very familiar with, the life and times of Job. In Job verse 1, and this is very familiar to most of us. We've heard about Job. But he says this, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. And this is the statement that's made of Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. I mean, that's the first thing that was said about Job. Job loved God so much that just in case that when his sons and daughters were having a party, if they had maybe cursed God silently in their heart, he made a sacrifice for them. I mean, that's how close he was. So we could ask Job, Job, do you love God? And his obvious answer would absolutely, I love God. Well, Job, how big is your God? Well, let me tell you how he's blessed me. In Job chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he had seven sons, three daughters. Anybody here have ten children? Okay. Job considered that a blessing. He owned 7,000 sheep, 
3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a, a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So why wouldn't he love God? With all of those blessings and, and all of those possessions and, and servants and children, an honored and esteemed man. But we might ask the question, Job, what if you lost it all? And we know the story in chapter one. His 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys were stolen. His 7,000 or his 3,000 camels destroyed. His 7,000 sheep destroyed. And finally, his precious children, his seven sons, his three daughters in a freak natural disaster, which there are none, all die. And in the context of the scripture, it seems that this happened one time after another in a very quick succession. Job, what do you have to say now about God? Now that you've lost everything, Job, everything that, that, that esteemed you, everything that, that made you valuable in, in people's eyes, and, and they looked up to you, Job. Man, Job, you are a blessed man. What do you have to say about God now, Job? Chapter 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Ready to curse God? Nope, not hardly. He fell to the ground in worship. Well, What's, what's, what's going on here? He said, Naked I came from my father's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Amen. <sighs> yes. Mm. Mm. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Wow. Job's God was a great God, wasn't it? A big God. But Job, what if you lost your health? What if you were experiencing terrible, horrific physical pain, Job? And his body, as we know, was covered from, from head to toe with open, running sores. Mm. Have any of you ever had shingles? No. Yes. Oh, I had shingles as a 20-something. It was stress-related. And I could still feel the intense pain of just a very small case of shingles, literally hurting to the bone. Mm. Can you imagine? Here is Job with shingle-like open sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and the only relief he could get was to take a piece of pottery and scrape it off. Oh, the intense pain. And his blessed dear wife says, Job, are you still holding on to your integrity? In other words, Job, what in the world is wrong with you? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. And he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Most modern Christians today would really, really struggle with that. Should we accept good from God and not trouble? <laughs> we live in a nation, we have been so blessed. 
And if we have just a little bit of trouble, God, God, where are you? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. And then his closest and dearest friends get word of the struggle that Job is having. And they come together and they say, let's go and let's sympathize and comfort our dear brother Job. And they come to Job and they begin sharing with Job truth from their perspective. I, I, a few weeks ago, I finished reading Job, and, and, and I saw it in a way that I hadn't seen it before, and I'd read it dozens before. Everything that those friends said was truth. It really was. But they were speaking truth from their perspective and not from God's great perspective. They shared truth. <coughs> But the truth they shared did not take into consideration that God in his great creativity on a regular basis does things that's beyond our experience. They were talking from their experience, but God was dealing with Job on a, on a different plane. After his friends accuse him of sin, of so many things, Job speaks in chapter 3, in verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Verse 11, why did I not perish at birth and die when I came out of the womb? And then in chapters 38 through 41, after the questioning continues with the friends, Job has a lot of questions for God. A lot of questions that you and I would have. And so at that point, God escorts Job on a journey of creation. And he doesn't offer any answers to Job's questions. No answers. But what we see is after God takes him on a journey, that Job humbly submits himself to God. And what Job learned in the end answers the question as to how big is your God. First thing that Job found in the end, after everything, was that there is nothing God can't do. There is nothing that God can't do. In Job chapter 42, the first part of verse 2, he says, I know you can do all things. I know you can do all things. All things. Now, I just want to ask the question Have you ever heard a definition of all? Yes. There, there's, there's rumbling in the congregation. <laughs> On the several times that I've been here, I have shared a definition of all. And for those of you that may be visiting or not have heard that or maybe have forgotten, Here's the greatest definition of all. All means all, that's all, all means. Did you get it? Yes. All, 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 and that's all that it means. I got it in the front. I'm not hearing anything from the back. <laughs> the definition of all is all. Take it, thank you. <laughs> Having heard and realized the unlimited power of God, Job, in the simplest terms, says this You can do all things. You can do all things. Now, remember the context that Job is saying this. Everything that he held dear is gone. Everything in life that gave him significance is gone. Except his relationship with God. Amen. And he says, I know you can do all things. 
God is omnipotent. Amen. He's all powerful. He has no limitations, seeks no approval. No obstacles hinder his way. The works of our Heavenly Father are always and completely effective. God is infinite. He looks to no other being for wisdom or understanding. He is constantly energized. He's never depleted. He creates from nothing without any loss of energy. He sustains all life without any assistance from us. He gives life and he takes life. He withholds the most powerful creature ever created, Satan himself. Nothing hinders God plan, God's plan. Nothing alters his plan. Amen. We could say, God is an awesome God. I think that's an overused word. I really do. I think in, in, in the repetition of saying God is awesome, we forget what awesome means. And, and it means he can do all things. At least four times in Scripture we read that nothing is impossible with God. You and I cannot come up with a situation that goes beyond the possibility of God working. So Job comes to an understanding that there is nothing that God can't do. Now the next thing that we see that Job understands, it is impossible to frustrate God's plans. It's impossible to frustrate God's plans. Second part of verse 2, chapter 42. No plans of yours can be thwarted. God's priorities are never thwarted. That means they're never cut off. No purpose of God can be disrupted. His purposes happen without delay, without hindrance, without fail. Everything that happens on this earth falls in the framework of exactly what God has purposed. Exactly. Do you realize nothing has ever occurred to God? Nothing. He is unfolding precisely his plan and things on this earth are never out of his control. How many of you have watched the news at least a bit this week? It seems like this world is absolutely spinning out of control. We read what's happening in our government, in our churches, in our schools. The sheer violence that's happening in, in our country and, and in countries across the world. Mm -hmm. And we wonder, what in the world is going on? And God knows. God knows. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, Daniel writes this. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one, no one can hold back his hand and say to him, what have you done? No one has the ability and the authority to do that. But let's just be honest and very vulnerable and transparent. 
How many times have we faced situations in life that are very painful, that are very difficult? And our human response, God, what have you done? God, why would you do this? Of all things, God, I've served you. God, why would you do this? Daniel says no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can prevent God's plan from running its course. And you say, oh, that's scary. No, no, no. It's not fearful. But you and I, when we realize how big our God is, we can take great comfort in that. We can take great comfort in that. Now, I want, I want to tell you, in, in 46 years of marriage and ministry, I look back and there were times that there were things going on that I had no clue. But it's only as I look back that I can, oh, oh. That was the reason, God. Job had experienced loss, humiliation, grief beyond anything that most of us have ever experienced, physical pain, emotional pain. Not that he, not that he just lost everything, he, he, he lost the support of his wife. His friends looked at him in judgment. He's a homeless man. Having once been the greatest of men of the East, now he is absolutely homeless. And when his friends showed up initially there in chapter 2, he was in such a physical and emotional state, they didn't even recognize him. But Job is realizing God's plans is God's plan. There's a, a song. It, it, it's a modern song. Joy in the morning. Have you ever heard that? Joy in the morning? Yes. There's a phrase in that song <clears throat> in the course that I hadn't noticed until just recently. But we know there's joy, joy comes in the morning, joy comes in the morning. But part of the course says this, if it's not good, God's not done. If it's not good, God's not done. Well, is that scriptural? Yeah, Romans 8, 28. And let I me mean, this, no, I won't quote it, I'll read it. And we know that in all things, we know, not we hope, we think, Think, but we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Written by the Apostle Paul, that great intellect, that great writer of almost half of the New Testament, that great man who had never suffered anything before writing this. Not true. <laughs> Rejected, shipwrecked, beaten, left for dead, hungry, thirsty, deserted. And he would write this because it's true. 
God's plans can never be thwarted. And what the comfort that we can have is we know, not hope, that in all, that means all, God works for good. Now, if you have a small view of God, you will choke on that. You will say, I don't understand this. This is not fair. This is not right. That is a small concept of God. And your life will reflect that concept of God. Yes. Yes, it will. Pain comes. Hmm. Difficulty comes. God, you've forsaken me. God, where are you? God, you're not doing what I think you should do, so therefore it must not be good. <laughs> I'll take it. Do it myself. The audacity of having that limited view of God. No wonder our churches are in such a mess. That our world, our nation, is so divided. Without any explanation as to his why questions, Job knows that he can trust God. Questions are not answered. <laughs> not a single question that Job answered, that asked, is answered. Not, not a single one of them. But it just didn't matter. When he began to understand his almighty, infinite, all-powerful God, his questions lost their significance. That which was so vitally important to having answers to no longer mattered. You see, when we are, when we are looking through the lens of truth, and Jesus says that truth will what? It will set us free. When we're looking through the lens of truth, it doesn't mean that our circumstances change, but when we're looking through the lens of truth of who God Almighty is, yes. our circumstances don't change, but how we view our circumstances begin yes. to radically change. Yes. That, which, that which robbed us of power and joy no longer matter. Because when we're looking through the lens of truth and we're understanding who God Almighty is and that He is a good, good Father, then we're able to Philippians 4 to think on these things. And it gives peace of heart and peace of mind. The third lesson that Job learned on how big God is, and this is a good, it's all good, but he says, God's plans are beyond our understanding and too deep to explain. Can anyone explain how birds know to fly south? <laughs> If I'm, they're just dumb birds no. that God created. Yes. Yes. God's plans are beyond our understanding, yes. too deep to explain. There are great scientists that can give explanations to what happens in our body and why it happens. But every doctor that is doctored for any amount of time has had cases that they cannot explain. Yeah. Yeah. They may be agnostic in their philosophy, but in their heart, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is something out there that is beyond their control. 
And this is what Job said in Job 42.3. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Job says this. Surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things that are too wonderful for me to know. That is a heartfelt confession. I spoke of things that I don't understand. Sometimes we need, to, we need that confession. God, I spoke of things that I didn't understand. Things that are too wonderful for me to know because if I knew it, it would scare me to death. <laughs> Here's the core of the message. Job is coming to understand that God's plans are beyond his understanding are too deep for him to explain because he is finite and God is infinite. There are times that we're disappointed with God. Let's just say it. Let's just put it out there. We've done the right thing and we've done it for the right reasons and look at how it turned out. God, how could you have allowed this? Because God reveals himself to be good and compassionate and loving, we expect him to, to, to respond in ways that fit into that character as we understand it. And then God doesn't do it the way that we want it done. Listen to what the author Philip Yancey writes. God could have said, Job, I'm truly sorry about what's happened. God says nothing of the kind. God doesn't explain. He explodes. He asks Job who he thinks he is anyway. God doesn't reveal his grand design. He reveals himself. It boils down to this. Until you know a little more about running the physical universe, then Job, don't help tell me how to run the moral universe. Job is whined. Why are you treating me so unfairly, God? Put yourself in my place. Nancy writes this, No, God thunders, you put yourself in my place until you can offer lessons on how to make the sun come up every day or where to scatter lightning bolts or how to design a hippopotamus. Don't judge how I run the world. Job, be quiet and listen. Although, Job, although God never answers one question about Job's predicament, the blast from that storm of truth flattens Job. He repents in dust and ashes and every trace of disappointment with God is swept away. Is your God that big? Maybe God doesn't explain himself because knowing and understanding his ways really wouldn't help us that much. Does knowing why really help? Is, is the pain removed by knowing the cause of the pain? Maybe God doesn't explain himself because you and I are incapable of understanding the depths of an almighty God. You see, what really bothers us is he doesn't act <coughs> the way we think he ought to act. And it comes right down to it. That, that's what really bothers us. He doesn't do what earthly fathers would have done in similar circumstances. And you want to know something? I'm glad he doesn't do what earthly fathers would do in similar circumstances. God Almighty allowed his son to be beaten, to be accused, to suffer the indignity of crucifixion. My daddy wouldn't have allowed, allowed that to happen. <coughs> My daddy would have fought tooth and nail. No, you will not treat my boy that way. No, you, wouldn't. You, you will not. You'll have to come through me if you're going to treat him that way. But God Almighty allowed his son 
to suffer all of that pain, all of that indignity. And he was there all the time. It was within the purpose and plan of God's divine appointment that his son would do that at the appointed time. I mean, can you explain that? If you have a small view of God, you can't. But we we understand that God Almighty was willing to sacrifice His Son so you and I could have a purpose in this life and the promise of eternal life. It would not have been the plan that I would have come up with. I would have come up, if, if, if I were God, which I am not, but if I were God, I would have come up with a, another plan. But His ways are beyond our understanding. Too deep for us to explain. Do you know what Job sees in the end? Job sees that God is enough. Amen. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> Sounds so simple. But in the end, he sees that God is enough. He doesn't see answers, but Job is in a place where he doesn't need answers because he understands how big God is. So my question this morning as we close, how big is your God? How big is your God? Are you struggling right now with the circumstances of life that you find yourself in? Maybe losses, a family member, financial losses, <coughs> physical losses. You can't do what you used to do. I'm finding out that's called aging. And the mind says, you sure can, just go do it. And the body says, you're a fool, you can't. And you're struggling with that. How big is your God? <coughs> There's nothing he can't do. Do, do. do you realize that he is at work behind the scenes in ways that you are totally oblivious to? Yes. Because if you knew what he was doing behind the scene, it would scare you to death. If you knew the full outcome, you would try to impede his plans. And, and you can't because it's impossible to frustrate God's plans and his purpose. Are you demanding answers to your questions that are so important? Let me just remind you. This is the God who laid the foundations of this world and the universe, who literally spoke and they came into existence. And you're demanding an explanation from him. <laughs> this is the same God that in his purpose and plan from the foundations of the earth when sin entered the world had a plan of redemption for you and I and his plan was always that his son would be slaughtered for you and I. Can you explain that? Do you understand why he would do that? But he did. And whatever the circumstances are in your life, if your God and your concept of God is as big as Job's, you will, be re you will release the demand for answers and trust in an almighty God who is at work in all things for my good and my purpose. And I don't need an explanation. But when I surrender to it, God, I don't understand it. I don't like it. But when I surrender to it, saying, God, absolute, unilateral, Nothing held back, God. I surrender. I surrender my questions. I surrender my loss. I surrender my pain. 
I surrender the things that I don't understand, God. I don't, but I surrender it. Thank you, Lord. This is what happens. All the things here no longer matter because we're at peace. Circumstances may not change, but how we view the circumstances radically change. Let's pray. How big is your God? Are you struggling? really struggling with that this morning. In just a moment, we're going to do communion. We're going to remember the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we prepare to do that, I want you to think, what answers have you been demanding that you just need to release to God today and say, God, I'm going to trust you. God, let me learn from your man Job that the answers that I've been demanding really don't matter because you are God. And I'm not. In the quiet of this moment, just before I pray, I would ask you to allow God to speak to you and respond in obedience. Father, you know us. You know us even better than we know ourselves. God, I don't know the hearts and minds of individuals here. I don't know the life situ situations and circumstances that they find themselves in. And I know that our, our mind, in our mind, we want answers. But even if we had answers, we may not still understand it. God, help us, help us to believe the truth of what your word declares about you. That if the situation right now is not good, then you're not finished. And live in the freedom of that. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you were, came in this morning, picked up a communion cup, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take the top one off and that has the bread there. And let's prepare to do in obedience what our Lord has told us to do. Apostle Paul, in writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, <coughs> took bread. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, Jesus, thank you for your body. Your body that came to this world, that lived among broken people, who brought healing, physical healing to so many. But you came to give your body for spiritual healing that was beyond our control. And so this morning, we remember your body as we take this bread. He broke it and said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he took the cup, 
saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The good news is this. He's coming back. Amen. He promised. He promised he was coming back. I'm going to pray. We'll stand and have a closing hymn. Father, thank you again that you are a great and mighty God. That you have a purpose and you have a plan. Sometimes our decisions get in the way and we mess out your blessing. But God, this morning as we have celebrated this ordinance that you left, that Jesus left for the church, may we leave here with a sense of excitement because of your promises based on the fact that you gave your body and you shed your blood so we could have a covering and a life in this world worth living and the promise of eternal life. We rejoice and give thanks in Jesus' name.